Thank you for joining us today for the implementation Inflation Reduction Act Details and Implementation Sunday Seminar. I'm Keston Bazinovich, CCL's Liaison Coordinator and Executive Assistant, and I'm pleased to introduce our two speakers today. Dana Nucitelli, CCL's Research Coordinator, is an environmental scientist and climate journalist with a master's degree in physics. He has written about climate change since 2010 for Skeptical Science, for The Guardian from 2013 to 2018, and since 2018 for Yale Climate Connections. In 2015, he published the book Climatology versus Pseudoscience, and he has also authored 10 peer-reviewed climate studies. Dana lives in California and in his free time enjoys playing tennis and spending time with his dogs. Kathy Kuntz is the director of the Office of Energy and Climate Change for the County of Dane in Wisconsin. Kathy aims to make it easy for everyone in Dane County to make choices that help achieve our ambitious climate goals. Kathy has almost 30 years of experience helping businesses and residents adopt sustainable practices. Prior to joining Dane County, Kathy led Cool Choices, where she worked with local governments and private businesses on sustainability efforts for about 10 years. Before that, she led Focus on Energy, Wisconsin's statewide energy efficiency and renewable energy program. Kathy enjoys gardening, biking, and travel. Thank you to both of our speakers for joining us, and I'll pass it over to Dana to get us started. Great. Thanks, Keston. Hi, everybody. Again, thanks for joining us again today. Let me get my slides going. I'm going to be going over the Inflation Reduction Act on kind of a broad scale, uh, the general stuff that it does. And then Kathy will go into some more local specifics. Uh, so, uh, Keston mentioned, I'm Dana Nicitelli, research coordinator, uh, environmental scientist, and climate journalist, uh, currently writing also for Yale Climate Connections. So, let's jump into it. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, we love it. It is a great bill. It is our first really major federal climate legislation with big uh, climate solutions in it. Um, and According to various uh, energy modeling groups, it will help us get to 40% uh, reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions in the United States below 2005 levels by 2030. If we can also get some permitting reform done, which I'll also be talking about today about the importance of combining permitting reform to make sure that we are able to achieve those emissions cuts. So uh, to put this into some graphical context, this is U.S. greenhouse gas emissions from 2005 through 2020-21 last year. Uh, you can see that we're, our emissions were going down a little bit slowly, but they were going down thanks to coal being phased out and replaced by cleaner electricity sources. You can see in the bottom right here, this red triangle is our Paris targets, trying to get to that 50% cuts by 2030. And so prior to the Inflation Reduction Act, this is the track that we were on in our business as usual, headed for something like a 27% cut in emissions by 2030 with some uncertainty there. Uh, so you can see roughly halfway short of our Paris target. And so this is why the Inflation Reduction Act was so important to get us accelerating this transition towards clean energy sources. And so the modeling groups looked at what the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, Reduction Act would achieve. And that's this green envelope here. Uh, you can see there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of a very big envelope there of possible uh, net greenhouse gas emissions reductions by 2030, because there's a lot of stuff that could happen over the next seven years. We don't know what fossil fuel prices, oil prices will look like. We don't know how many people will take advantage of the tax incentives and rebates in the Infl Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, so there's a variety of different factors that create this big uncertainty window uh, of possible emissions cuts going into the future. And one of those big uncertainty factors is permitting, because as I'll talk about permitting right now is going quite slowly, which probably right now puts us on the higher end of this envelope. But um, on average, uh, the middle of this window is a 40% cut below 2005 levels by 2030, which would be a really big uh, boost from our previous business as usual of 27% cuts, getting us much closer, not all the way to our Paris target, but much closer to it. So that's why we were 
super excited and happy about the Inflation Reduction Act getting passed. So what exactly is in the bill and how does it achieve those cuts? Uh, the biggest single factor is the tax credits for clean energy sources like wind and solar, uh, but there's also some for uh, geothermal, for nuclear, uh, basically anything that's a low carbon or zero carbon electricity source gets a tax credit uh, extending over the next decade. So there's a lot of certainty for individuals and businesses and private equity trying to invest in these clean energy projects. Now they know that tax credits will be there in the long term. And so now there's going to be this really big boost in investments in these clean energy sources. And that's going to hopefully decarbonize our electricity sector and make a big difference in our emissions reductions. Uh, we, of course, are also very excited about the methane fee in the Inflation Reduction Act. It's going to be combined with some updated EPA methane regulations on the oil and gas sector, which the EPA is in the process of working on. The EPA says that once those are finalized, they will reduce oil and gas uh, sector methane pollution by about 87%. So really tackling those uh, the leakage and other uh, methane releases from the oil and gas sector. And then the methane fee is basically like the teeth to those regulations. So if a company or a facility is not in compliance with those new, more stringent EPA methane regulations, then they will have to pay the methane fee in the Inflation Reduction Act. So that's really important to give that kind of enforcement mechanism and that financial incentive for oil and gas companies and facilities to actually be in compliance with those methane regulations. So it's our first federal climate pollution fee. Uh, it's not a carbon price, but it's a methane price. It's a good start and it kind of sets the table for future uh, carbon pollution uh, and other greenhouse gas pollution fees, we hope. Then there are the incentives tax credits for electric vehicles, uh, which are a little bit complicated because it depends on kind of the source of the minerals and where the batteries are manufactured. But generally speaking, there's going to be some nice uh, tax credits for electric cars, both used and new ones. Uh, so that would be really nice to get some uh, tax credits for used cars and get people buying some used EVs so that not everybody has to buy new ones. Uh, there's also uh, some great incentives for and, and uh, rebates for building electrification and efficiency that I'll talk about. Uh, there's some funding for natural climate solutions like healthy forests, of course, that we are beginning to work on in CCL. And there's some incentives for uh, clean technology innovation and a domestic green manufacturing to get more of these green clean technologies built and manufactured in the United States, which is great. So we're not relying on other countries like China so much to build and manufacture these green technologies. So uh, the IRA was a long time in the making. We've been working for a long time trying to get federal climate policy passed. Uh, was, you, know, you can go as far back as Bill Clinton in the 1990s trying to pass a dirty energy tax that failed pretty badly. And then there was you know, the Waxman-Markey cap and trade bill in 2009 that passed the House and then died the quiet death in the Senate that so much legislation does thanks to the filibuster. And so now, you know, what is it, 12 years after that, we finally got a major climate bill passed through Congress. So uh, there's a variety of factors that's uh, helped us get that over the finish line. There was, of course, the great grassroots advocacy from CCL volunteers and other climate advocacy organizations, uh, letting our members of Congress know how important this is to everybody uh, to get this done. Uh, there was support from businesses and industry Notably, there was not really strong opposition by the fossil fuel industry, which is also very always very helpful because the fossil fuel industry is very powerful and influential and good at killing legislation that they don't like. And so their lack of lack of opposition kind of helped the Inflation Reduction Act get passed. Uh, of course, in the last decade plus, there's been uh, worsening extreme weather events like heat waves, wildfires, floods, droughts, hurricanes. And so people are just becoming more aware of the threats that climate change poses as they are directly impacted by these extreme weather events or seeing these extreme weather events impact everybody else on TV. 
And uh, really importantly, the costs of clean energy technologies like solar panels, wind turbines, batteries have just plummeted over the past decades. They're much, much, much affordable than they were even five, 10 years ago. And so when these solutions are affordable, then uh, people are much more open to policies that help implement them. And so and basically cheap stuff is popular. And so clean technologies are now quite popular. So uh, I talked about this a bit in yesterday's uh, session, but uh, you CCL volunteers, you guys did a whole lot of work to get the CCL, uh, to get the Inflation Reduction Act over the finish line over the year that led up to the bill's passage. And it was just about a year, thanks to uh, Joe Manchin doing Joe Manchin stuff. Uh, we held 920 meetings with congressional offices over that year. We had 225,000 contacts to Congress, including over 50,000 phone calls. In the last two weeks, when we were really trying to get it over the finish line, we had 10,000 contacts with our members of Congress during those two weeks, which I'm sure was really important and helped convey again that their constituents wanted them to get this thing done. And we published over 2,000 letters to the editor and 676 op-eds over that year. So a lot of great work by CCL volunteers, uh, along with other or, uh, climate advocacy organizations, and of course, our allies in Congress to make sure that the Inflation Reduction Act got over the finish line and got passed, and we finally got this major federal climate policy success. So let's talk about some of the stuff that the IRA does and the benefits in the bill. Uh, one really big one is that by phasing out fossil fuels and replacing them with clean energy sources, that reduces not just greenhouse gas pollution, but other uh, air pollutants. And so in the process, that reduction in air pollution is projected to save 180,000 American lives, avoiding all these premature deaths associated with people breathing all that air pollution. It protects against what we call fossilflation, which is uh, inflation that is exacerbated or uh, created by spiking fossil fuel prices. Um, so that's like one reason why it is fair to call it the Inflation Reduction Act, is that quite often when we have an inflationary period, fossil fuels play a really big role because fossil fuel, especially oil and gas prices, are very unstable. And so when they spike up, uh, because so much of the economy still relies on fossil fuels, that causes just everything in the economy, all the prices to spike up. And so fossil fuels are a very big contributor to inflation in general and the current inflationary period we're seeing right now. And so it generally, anytime we can you know, replace fossil fuels with cleaner electricity sources and energy sources, that protects against uh, future inflationary periods. And uh, by helping people transition to electric cars, electric vehicles, uh, the bill will save car owners over $500 per year because it is much cheaper to fuel a vehicle with electricity than it is to fuel it with gasoline because, again, gasoline prices are very, they vary wildly. They're very unstable and oftentimes they're quite high as we've been seeing over the past couple of years. And so, and also electric cars just in general are much more efficient than gasoline powered cars. And so it saves a lot of money if you don't have to buy gasoline all the time. Uh, also, we get lower electricity costs from the IRA because wind and solar are so cheap and we're going to be deploying uh, so much more wind and solar, hopefully, that will reduce electricity costs. So it will save household electricity bills and it will also save business electricity bills. And so the businesses will pass those some of those savings onto their customers. And so when you combine those two household savings and business savings, it will save households about $200 per year in lower electricity costs. And then on top of that, homeowners have all these rebates and tax credits that they can take advantage for to electrify and make their homes more energy efficient. And that can save hundreds of dollars on monthly energy bills on top of those uh, savings on electricity costs, thanks to the cheap wind and solar energy. And so let's talk about those potential benefits for homeowners. Uh, I talked about this a little bit yesterday, but we have this great tool from Rewiring America called the IRA Savings Calculator. We got the short URL at the top of the screen here, cclusa.org slash IRA-calc, 
will take you to this Rewiring America Savings Calculator. And so this tells people basically what uh, tax incentives and rebates they qualify for in home upgrades uh, through the Inflation Reduction Act. So it's especially good for low and middle income households. Low income households have 100% of their costs up to $14,000 per household plus tax credits covered by the uh, benefits in the Inflation Reduction Act. Middle income households get 50% coverage and these are defined as a low income household is 80% or less of the local median income and a middle income household is 80% to 150% of the local median income. And so you don't have to like look up the local median income and figure out where you fall. This is all incorporated into the Rewiring America Savings Calculator. And so you just put in your zip code, homeowner status, household income, tax filing status, and household size. And it will plug that all in and calculate it for you and tell you which of these uh, incentives you qualify for, whether they are tax credits or upfront rebates. Uh, how large they are and when they come into effect, whether they're already into effect or 2023 or 2024. So this is a really great tool uh, for educating yourself and your friends and family uh, and anybody you know about which of these incentives you can qualify for to uh, electrify and make your home more efficient. Uh, for example, there are uh, rooftop, there's rooftop solar, there's water pump or water heater heat pumps. There is a uh, household uh, HVAC system heat pumps. Uh, there is uh, electric stoves. Uh, there is building insulation and wet and windows to, to weatherize your homes. So there's a lot of different, um, and then you know, there's a lot more than that. So there's a lot of different incentives that you could potentially qualify for. So we encourage everybody to check this out and to tell everybody you know about this calculator so that we can get people taking advantage of these incentives because like it's great that the incentives are there but if people aren't taking advantage of them then they're not doing anybody any good and so education on this topic is really important and it's a big component of our building electrification and efficiency policy agenda as i talked about yesterday so in general the ira is going to make a big change in the u.s economy as a whole so in 2030, we're expecting up to 85% of our electricity to come from clean sources, uh, predominantly from solar and wind. Uh, I talked about yesterday, right now we have something like, I think it was 260 gigawatts of solar and wind electricity installed in the United States, uh, which we've installed over the past 20 years. And we're gonna do something like, I think 760 gigawatts uh, projected over the next seven years. And so like, if you imagine all the solar panels and wind turbines in the United States right now, if you triple that, that is what we are projecting will be built and installed over the next seven years, again, with the permitting reform caveat that we'll talk about. So lots and lots of wind turbines and solar panels hopefully getting deployed in the United States, kind of a mind blowing amount. Uh, another big change is in vehicle sales. Um, it's hard to predict exactly the number of new car sales in 2030 that will be electric. The challenge is that like electric cars will be probably the cheapest cars to buy in 2030 because for one thing, battery costs are going to keep going down and then we will have uh, all the car companies will probably at that point have made the changes in their um, production necessary to qualify for the tax credits in the Inflation Reduction Act. They'll all be domestic. Uh, or made or mined in uh, free trade uh, allies. And so at that point, uh, car electric cars would be cheaper to buy up front than gasoline cars. They're already cheaper to fuel than gasoline cars, and they are cheaper to maintain already than gasoline cars because they have fewer moving parts. You don't have to do oil changes and things like that. And so electric cars are going to be the cheapest option straight up. But that doesn't so that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to buy an electric car because people have kind of maybe emotional attachments to gasoline power cars or that's what they're used to that's the status quo and so when uh, like the princeton group uh there's a princeton energy modeling group that was modeling like what would the new car sales look like in 2030 just based on financial incentives and they had 100 percent of new cars in 2030 being sold will be electric because everybody's going to buy the cheapest option right and then they thought about it and they're like well Maybe not because, you know, 
people behave strangely sometimes. They don't necessarily just buy the cheapest thing. And so it's really difficult to know what percentage of new car sales in 2030 will be electric. Probably something like half. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see. We're going to do like a little experiment in psychology uh, and social behavior to see like what percentage of new cars sales in 2030 are electric. But it's going to be some big percentage. And right now it's like 5%. So it's going to be a huge change um, with a lot of new car sales being electric in 2030. And then thanks to the incentives for companies to do this domestic clean energy manufacturing there's going to be a whole bunch of new jobs in clean energy to deploy all these wind turbines and solar panels and clean manufacturing, also building retrofits because everybody's going to be, well, a lot of people are going to be, you know, taking advantage of these incentives to get the new, you know, heat pumps and uh, induction stoves and insulation and things like that. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of jobs in making that happen. We're going to need actually a lot new electricians because we're also going to have to do a uh, home wiring upgrades to make sure that the home wiring systems can uh, can take care of all that increased demand for electricity. And so there's actually a little bit of a concern. Maybe we won't have enough electricians trained by 2030 to make this all happen. And so like, if you know anybody who's trying to figure out what career to go into, like electrician is going to be a really uh, good career. That's going to, it's going to pay well. It's going to have a lot of job security because we're going to need a lot of these electric upgrades. So the IRA also invests in cities. It has investments for EVs and public transit charging, which is really important because if you don't have uh, EV charging stations, then you can't make these upgrades. People won't buy EVs and you know we can't uh, do like electric buses and things like that if we don't have the charging systems to charge them. So that's really important infrastructure investments. Uh, there's also energy efficiency credits and rebates for businesses, schools, churches, and government buildings. That was always a challenge because like businesses and schools and churches, they don't have tax liability. And so they can't take advantage of tax credits since they don't have any tax liability to offset. And so there was a change in the Inflation Reduction Act that they can take the tax credit and transfer it to like an architect or a construction work, uh, to a group or something like that, who can then give them a rebate or uh, basically give them a discount. And so there basically allows them to take advantage of these tax credits. There are also rebates for zero emissions, garbage trucks and buses, uh, which is great, uh, especially buses like they're always going around the city and like if they're, you know, using diesel or gasoline, they're creating a lot of pollution as they drive by. And so like, that's a really good use for electric uh, vehicles because then they're not creating that local air pollution and they're always going the same route and then stopping overnight. And so that's a great opportunity for them to charge up. Um, so that's a great application. Uh, there are also grants for cities to grow urban forests, uh, which I talked about yesterday is really important, especially as we're seeing more extreme heat waves in cities. You got all this concrete and asphalt that kind of absorbs and radiates, radiates the heat. And so cities are particularly hot and particularly impacted by these worsening heat waves. And so the more green spaces and, and urban trees you can plant, the more relief it gives from those heat waves. And that's a really important kind of adaptation solution in addition to pulling the carbon out of the atmosphere. There's also specific investments for disadvantaged communities. Uh, there's funding for community-led projects for equitable transportation access uh, to reduce pollution at key pollution hubs like ports and railways and airports and near schools so that people in those communities aren't breathing all of that air pollution. Uh, and there are also grants for energy efficient affordable housing, uh, which is great. Anything we can do to improve energy efficiency and housing especially in communities that it's difficult for them to afford is, is excellent. And specifically, there's this thing called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is also known as the National Green Bank. Uh, so there's $27 billion of funding for that green bank that will go for uh, direct and indirect investments in projects to reduce greenhouse gases at the local level. A whole bunch of that for disadvantaged communities. There's specifically $7 billion available for low-income and disadvantaged communities to deploy or benefit from rooftop solar, which we all, of course, love rooftop solar and other greenhouse gas reduction activities. There is $12 billion available to reduce or avoid greenhouse gas and other air pollution by leveraging investments from the private sector or by assisting communities in efforts to reduce or avoid pollution in other ways. And that's a project that 
or a funding stream that is administered by the EPA. And that's something that we're hoping a lot of cities and disadvantaged communities can take advantage of. On top of that, there are these climate pollution reduction grants. Uh, these are for municipalities uh, that want to take climate action and planning to reduce their greenhouse gas pollution. So those have to include information about how they're going to reduce their greenhouse gas air pollution uh, in low income and disadvantaged communities. So again, it's specifically targeting disadvantaged communities to help them reduce their air pollution or uh, carbon pollution. Again, that's administered by the EPA and there's this uh, requirement that there has to be at least one grant in each state. So we're trying to kind of spread it out so that everybody is able to take advantage of these funds and these grants. Uh, and then there's some provisions to help cities reduce their emissions. There is uh, funding available for cities to do zero building energy code adoptions. So this is basically to encourage cities to improve their building codes to basically require new buildings to uh, be more energy efficient uh, through the building code process, which is a really good way because you know any new building you have to, you're constructing has to follow the local building codes. And so the more stringent they are, those building codes in requiring that buildings be energy efficient and low carbon, that will do a lot to reduce emissions from the building sector uh, in cities where there's a lot of buildings. There is also a clean heavy duty vehicles program where municipalities and nonprofit school transportation associations will be eligible for funding to replace uh, fossil fuel uh, vehicles, uh, heavy duty vehicles with zero emissions vehicles. Uh, so that again is things like um, garbage trucks, heavy duty trucks, buses. Uh, I believe this applies to school buses, which again, like I'm a big fan of getting electric school buses because you get the school bus driving up when there's a bunch of kids waiting in line and they're breathing all the diesel uh, pollution from the exhaust of the bus. And so, you know, that's creates all kinds of adverse health effects for the kids. And so if you can electrify that, that eliminates that pollution source and makes kids healthier. And again, the buses are going the same route every day and then they park overnight where they could be charging up if there is a charging station. And so electrification of school buses is like a really big win, win, win. Like it's something we should be doing as much and as quickly as possible. So that's another EPA program. There is also a low emissions electricity program that allocates funding via the EPA for outreach and technical assistance to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from domestic electricity and generation and use. Uh, there's also some programs for resilience and adaptation to the impacts of climate change. So for example, there's environmental and climate justice block grants for community-led effort, efforts to monitor, prevent, and remedy pollution, plus investments in low and zero emissions resilient technologies. And there's forestry conservation programs, which is again kind of relevant to our healthy forest policy agenda area. So these are through the Department of Agriculture, to support tree planting activities through urban community forestry assistance program. And then it's not just cities, of course, there are also investments in rural communities. Uh, so for example, there is money for wildfire resilience and to help firefighters who are always fighting worse and worse wildfires. That's really important. Like for me, I'm in California and these wildfires are a super big concern here as they keep getting worse. And so the more funding we can uh, send to programs to make us more resilient to wildfires and to lessen wildfire threats, the better. So I think there was $7 billion in funding for wildfire resilience uh, between the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Package. There's also $4 billion, I believe, for drought mitigation and resilience, uh, doing things like helping farmers to be more water efficient. Uh, because agriculture is a big use of water. And again, in the West, we're really concerned about these worsening droughts and lack of water availability. And so there's funding to help uh, farmers in particular use less water, also to protect existing bodies of water so that we're drawing less from those bodies of water and preserving them as best as possible. So yeah, great uh, funding for addressing drought threats. There are clean energy grants to electric co-ops, and there's also clean energy investments uh, and jobs that will particularly benefit rural communities because uh, as I talked about yesterday, 
Uh, we're going to be building all these big wind and solar farms. And because land in rural areas is much more available and affordable than land in urban areas, that's where most of these big solar and wind farms get built. And that creates a lot of jobs in rural areas and also creates revenue streams from uh, leasing of land, from taxes and things like that. And so this is why clean energy tends to be very popular in even red states with a lot of rural areas because they get a lot of economic benefits from it. You know, the biggest wind states are like Texas and Iowa and Kansas and Oklahoma, you know, down the middle of the country where there's a lot of wind. And these are pretty red states and they love their wind uh, energy because it brings in a lot of jobs and revenue. And then there's also assistance for farmers, ranchers, and foresters. Uh, so there is a bunch of money for conservation programs to store carbon in soil and trees. Uh, this is a really interesting one. So it was kind of labeled as 20 plus billion dollars for like climate smart uh, agriculture and forestry programs. So these go to existing programs and the challenge is that they these programs don't currently include carbon and climate as criterion for uh, the programs that they provide grants for. Uh, so they're kind of more general conservation programs that aren't particularly climate programs. And so one thing we're hoping to possibly work on in the coming year is to use the Farm Bill to tweak these programs to make climate and or carbon a top criterion so that those $20 billion in funds can actually be spent on things that are good for the climate and not just on general uh, conservation programs, but on things like silvo pasture that I talked about yesterday or cover cropping on farms, things that actually remove carbon from the atmosphere. So I'm hoping we can work on that in the coming year. We're going to have to see if that's a good option for us. There's also funding for forest health, for forest preservation, uh, for things that protect existing forests in the United States, uh, money for climate smart forest management and conservation, uh, including particularly on privately owned forests, giving pri private forest owners some incentives to uh, do practices that will, that will conserve the forest and conserve the carbon that is being sequestered by the trees. And then there's also kind of indirect benefits that when, again, we are phasing out fossil fuel pollution by transition to clean energy, and fossil fuel ozone pollution turns out to suppress crop yields. And so as we phase out these fossil fuels and transition to clean energy and reduce our ozone air pollution, that will increase crop yields. And that's estimated to benefit American farmers to the tune of something like $400 million per year, just from the larger crop yields they're going to get from the cleaner air resulting from the clean energy deployed by the IRA. So uh, that's the good news. The challenging news uh, I talked a bit about yesterday in the permitting reform parts of our new policy agenda. So the good news again is that solar and wind are going to explode thanks to those tax credits, hopefully a tripling of the solar and wind energy in the United States over the next seven years. But those big wind and solar farms are going to get built out in the rural areas. Uh, also out in the middle of the country. Again, that's where we have most of the wind uh, blowing that's available. And so you need to be able to transmit that electricity from those wind turbines and solar panels out kind of where there's fewer people to the population centers, mostly along the coasts and in cities that have the demand for the clean electricity. And so to do that, you need to build some long distance transmission lines to connect the clean electricity to get it to the population centers that need it. But uh, that is right now a very slow process. Right now we're only expanding our electric transmission infrastructure at 1% per year, and we need to speed that up. We need to get it to at least 2% per year, ideally. Uh, the good news is we were expanding it at 2% per year uh, a couple of decades ago. That used to be the norm, and it's just it's slowed down over the past decade or so as stuff has been kind of clogged up in the permitting process and other factors slowing down our infrastructure build out. The challenge is, uh, as I talked about yesterday, we need to triple our, tr our transmission of clean electricity by 2050 if we're going to hit our net zero pledge under the Paris Agreement. And it takes uh, agencies an average of four and a half years to complete an environmental impact statement for really big energy projects that could potentially have some uh, significant environmental impacts. And that is a very long time. And just in general, 
transmission lines right now take on average a little over a decade to build in the United States. And 2030 is now about seven years away. And so we're just not building this infrastructure fast enough and especially transmission lines not building them fast enough to get this deployment of clean energy accomplished and meet our Paris targets and you know, uh, um, take advantage of these IRA uh, emissions, uh, emissions reductions. So this is why permitting reform is critical if we're going to make this clean energy transition happen fast enough to meet our Paris commitments. Uh, and the estimate, according to modeling by the Princeton uh, Energy Modeling Group, uh, is that if we don't start building clean energy infrastructure faster, we're only going to achieve about 20% of the potential mm -hmm. carbon pollution reductions from the Inflation Reduction Act. So we need to speed things up to unlock those benefits. So uh, I showed this chart yesterday, but we're looking at uh, the difference between uh, making these transmission uh, build-outs and uh, achieving permitting reform and not doing so. So this, again, similar chart is our emissions to date between mm -hmm. 2005 and 2022. Uh, the black dotted line across the middle is our Paris target, trying to get to that 50% cuts by 2030. Right now, we're on track for something like 28%. Again, there's lots of uncertainty, as we saw in that previous chart. A lot of uncertainty in exactly what this number is going to be in 2030 because of fossil fuel prices and federal efforts to do permitting reform and things like that. But we're somewhere in this ballpark on this track right now. But if we can get the permitting reform unlocked uh, and make our infrastructure build up happen faster uh, through things like uh, federal efforts and congressional permitting reform, then we can get to those 40% emissions reductions that we talked about earlier from the Inflation Reduction Act and get much closer to our Paris targets. And then uh, we talked about yesterday, there's also more stuff we can do. We can get a carbon price in place along with permitting reform that would get us to achieving our Paris target of over 50% cuts by 2030. And we can also do uh, some carbon removal through healthy forests to pull some more carbon out of the atmosphere and uh, deploy these IRA benefits uh, and incentives for building efficiency and electrification, uh, get lots of heat pumps out there and building insulation and things like that, uh, solar panels on people's roofs. And then we can get to potentially a 60% reduction in emissions by 2030 if we can get all that stuff done in the coming uh, few years. So again, very ambitious, but we like being ambitious and that's what we're gonna try to do. So uh, this is also really important to accomplish for disadvantaged communities because air pollution causes about 250,000 deaths per year in the United States, especially in disadvantaged communities located near big uh, fossil fuel pollution sources like coal power plants. And so if we are not making this transition fast enough and the permitting process slows everything down and we're not building out this clean energy infrastructure, then we have to keep burning that coal which then keeps creating that air pollution, which creates thousands of needless premature deaths in these communities that could be avoided if we could transition to the clean energy economy. And the good news, as I discussed yesterday, is most of the infrastructure we're building right now is for clean energy. 93% uh, of the energy capacity we're wait that's waiting to be built in the queue right now is solar and wind electricity. So it's we're, really what we're trying to build right now is the clean stuff. And uh, in the uh, global demand right now, uh, the fossil fuel demand is peaking as I'm gonna show in the next charts. So this is a chart from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab showing what we have built in terms of new electricity capacity since 2007 through 2021. Uh, you can see the uh, black on the bottom is coal, the brownish ugly color is natural gas, uh, orange and yellow are solar, uh, Purple, violet is wind, and red is uh, storage, generally batteries. So you can see, you know, about a decade ago, a lot of what we were building was uh, natural gas plus a little bit of coal and a fair amount of wind. But you know, it was roughly 50-50 uh, starting in about a decade ago. Before that, it was mostly uh, fossil fuels. But then, if you move on forward, it gets to be more and more and more renewable energy. And you can see in 2021, it was way like predominantly. Uh, clean energy. It was uh, mostly solar, also quite a lot of wind and very little gas. Overall, 85% of the new electricity capacity in 2021 
was uh, solar plus wind plus battery storage. Uh, I think in 2022, it's going to be something like 70 to 80 percent. And then again, I mentioned what's in the queue. This is also from Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Uh, so you can see on the bottom each type of electricity. The bar on the right for each one is 2021. So for example, this bar here uh, on the right of the solar is the amount of solar electricity in the queue waiting to be built in the United States in 2021. Uh, there's storage is the next largest, there's wind is the next largest, and there's only a little bit of gas and not much else. So again, the vast majority of what is waiting to be built is solar and wind with oftentimes battery storage being connected to it to phase out fossil fuels as quickly as possible. And so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's also a, we're arriving at the peak of fossil fuel demand globally. Uh, so this is a chart uh, from one of our expert energy groups. Uh, you can see we're showing uh, this is overall global fossil fuel demand. We're right around here, 2022. You can see we're right around the peak already and plateauing right now. And then global fossil fuel demand is projected to decline over time. Uh, here's a similar chart from the Inter uh, International Energy Agency, the IEA. Uh, this is looking at a current policies uh, scenario, so not accounting for any future fault po future policies that might be passed by countries to further reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but just what's in place right now. Uh, so the overall size is the overall fossil fuel demand. You can see it peaks again right around 2025, and then it declines thereafter. And again, that's going to just decline faster as more countries implement more stringent climate policies. And then one more, this was from McKinsey, breaking it down by type of fossil fuel. And you can see the dark blue is coal. Uh, coal demand globally already peaked almost a decade ago. Uh, oil demand is projected to peak very, very soon by 2025. Again, thanks to a lot of countries transitioning towards electric vehicles. Uh, it's going to reduce our oil demand over time pretty quickly. And then natural gas is still increasing uh, pretty slowly, but it's still increasing. There's a lot of natural gas replacing coal, for example, but it's projected to peak in 2035. Again, just based on current policies, uh, we could do better as we accelerate, for example, uh, getting more buildings to use heat pumps instead of natural gas heating, things like that. Right now, the projection, though, is for 2035 peak in natural gas. And if you combine these all together, then it's very similar to the International Energy Agency projection. You get a global overall fossil fuel peak demand by 2025, if not sooner. So basically, the, ish, the uh, crux of this is as we transition towards clean energy economies in virtually every country, fossil fuel demand is going to go down. And so if we can build things faster, that will benefit clean energy. Uh, I also showed this one yesterday, but this is a really important point to make because uh, a failure in this permitting reform and transitioning towards uh, getting our clean energy deployed is really bad for disadvantaged communities located near fossil fuel pollution sources. Uh, so this is a chart that I uh, made from data from the Princeton Energy Group's uh, modeling of different scenarios looking at how much coal we're going to burn in the United States in 2030. Uh, this red bar on the left is how much we were projected to burn, how much coal we were projected to burn in 2030 before the IRA was passed. The gray bar is after the IRA was passed. If we continue to build out our transmission infrastructure at just 1% per year, that same rate that we've been doing over the past decade. And you can see that bar is larger because of all these incentives uh, for electrification for people to get electric cars, electric water heaters, electric home heat, pu heat, 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 heat pumps. Uh, electric stoves, uh, all these different things that are going to increase our electricity demand. And if we can't meet that electricity demand with new wind and solar farms being connected to the grid via long distance transmission lines, that increased demand gets met by burning more fossil fuels, meaning you're burning more coal, you're burning more natural gas, and that creates or continues uh, the other air pollution associated with those fossil fuels that communities located near those pollution sources have to breathe. And so it actually backfires a little bit for those communities. You burn more coal than you would otherwise have if you're not building transmission fast enough. If you do accelerate transmission build up to 1.5 or 2% or maybe 2.5% ideally per year, accelerate the whole process, then you can see 
the amount of coal burned goes down and we get cleaner air in addition to lower greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so it's very important, not just for meeting our climate goals, but also for reducing air pollution that adversely impacts people's health, especially in those disadvantaged communities. So if you put that all together, this is kind of our overall calculus on the importance of clean energy permitting reform. We need to build out that clean energy faster for the climate so that we can meet our Paris commitments and unlock those benefits of emissions reductions from the IRA. We also need to do uh, a faster clean energy infrastructure build out for disadvantaged communities so that we can transition away from those dirty fossil fuel sources that create the air pollution that they're breathing. And most of what's being slowed down by the permitting process right now is clean energy. That is most of what we're building right now. That is the vast majority of what's in the queue waiting to be built. Uh, also permitting just generally already a little bit easier for fossil fuels. Uh, for example, uh, interstate natural gas trans, uh, pipelines are, are the, oh, their oversaw, the overseeing of the permitting process is done by FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So FERC can approve a natural gas pipeline that goes through many states, but they can't do the same for a long distance transmission line that goes through a bunch of different states. They don't have that authority, which means that if you have a long distance transmission line, for example, taking wind from a wind farm in Wyoming, trying to take it to like California, going through a bunch of states in the middle, then those project uh, creators have to get permits in every single state that the pipe that the uh, transmission line will go through. And that's a very slow process. And so that's one thing we could do is give FERC that authority to authorize uh, an interstate long distance transmission lines. Uh, also, it's just there are fewer permitting requirements for oil and gas exploration and drilling than there is for geothermal, for example. There's also there's already a bunch of benefits uh, that uh, fossil fuel projects have for an expedited permitting process that clean energy projects don't have. And so again, like the more we can do to accelerate the permitting process, the more it will offset uh, those advantages that the fossil fuel industry already has, and it would just help if we just accelerate permitting in general, because most of what the demand is for now is clean energy, it will mostly benefit clean energy projects. So just in general, permitting reform is probably a good idea. Uh, and uh, a lot of different uh, voices from different perspectives uh, have come to the same uh, conclusion that this is an important thing to do. Uh, we talked to, we heard from T Senator Tina Smith yesterday uh, at our conference, and she has been one of the voices saying we need permitting reform so that wind and solar energy from rural Minnesota gets to cities and towns across this country. Uh, so the climate hawks like Senator Tina Smith, like Sheldon Whitehouse, Brian Schatz, uh, all these really great climate champions in the Senate, uh, they are really on board with getting permitting reform done because they recognize how important it is for unlocking these uh, emissions reductions benefits. Uh, Bill McKibben, uh, of course, uh, the founder of 350.org, uh, great ally of ours, has said similar things. There's no question that we need both permitting reform and a kind of change in our attitude around this stuff so that the uh, climate movement is not focusing so much on stopping uh, projects, fossil fuel projects from being built but instead focusing more on getting clean energy projects built. Uh, because again, right now, like that is the problem. The problem is not as much like the fossil stuff that's being built because there's less demand for fossil fuels and that demand is going to peak and decline over time. And so the big problem now is actually getting the clean stuff built and deployed so that it can replace that fossil fuel energy. And then uh, Representative Curtis uh, from Utah, another great ally of ours, has also said we all agree permitting reform needs to be done, and I think we can get it across the finish line. So we've got bipartisan support. Uh, there are, of course, different perspectives in Congress about what the priorities in permitting reform specifically should be, but there is at least a general bipartisan mm -hmm. agreement that we need to get something done in a permitting reform package. So how do we do that? Uh, the good news is that the bipartisan infrastructure bill passed a year ago and the Inflation Reduction Act already had uh, some measures to help speed up the process, especially the Inflation Reduction Act had funding for federal agencies that do these environmental impact assessments and other environmental reviews during the permitting process. 
So if they have more funding, they can hire more staff and devote more resources to getting these uh, reviews done in a more expedited manner. And so that by itself should somewhat speed up the process uh, to get these projects permitted and going. Uh, there is also the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, uh, that has proposed a number of different uh, new rules to do things like, for one, for one example, they're trying to do cost allocation, which is an issue where when you have a pretty long transmission line, uh, it's, and then everybody starts to fight over who's going to pay for how much of it, and that fight can really slow down the process. Uh, so FERC's got a proposed rule that at least for some types of transmission lines, they can allocate the costs to basically the proportion of the benefits that different utilities and individuals get. And so if they can just do that kind of automatically and get everybody to agree, uh, which is a challenge that FERC kind of has to get everybody to agree to make this happen, uh, then that can really speed up the process by avoiding these fights. That's also something that was included in the permitting reform proposal from Senator Manchin to kind of just make that a general rule uh, so that that's kind of automatically happens to avoid these fights. Um, so things like that uh, from FERC, uh, they're trying to accelerate the process by loosening up these bottlenecks, also doing like multiple reviews at once instead of doing one review of one project at a time, reviewing multiple projects that are similar all at the same time. So FERC is doing what they can do. And then there's also federal law changes by Congress, uh, trying to expedite the process by, again, giving FERC more authority for these interstate lines, the cost allocations that I talked about, things like that. Uh, members of Congress are working hard to figure out what they can accomplish through uh, federal congressional permitting reform package agreement, which maybe they'll put something forth in the lame duck session or otherwise we're working on it next year. And that's where CCL comes in. Once they come out with a package, we will evaluate it, figure out if we can support it, which hopefully we can, at which points we will, of course, educate our volunteers and get some advocacy and try to convey to our members of Congress how important this is based on all this information uh, to unlock those climate benefits from the IRA and get this done. Uh, so uh, I talked about this yesterday, but specific policies that CISO supports in the clean energy permitting reform area are those that add to America's capacity to transmit clean electricity, that speed up the approval of clean energy projects that are waiting to be built, those, all those projects in the queue that we looked at in that chart earlier, and that protect communities' ability to make their voices heard in that permitting process in those environmental reviews of environmental and other impacts of proposed energy projects. So uh, there is, of course, the political sausage making challenge that we always face. Uh, we recognize that the political realities of our democratic system, uh, which force compromises among lawmakers who have a range of different priorities. So as we begin to work on this issue, we are going to evaluate any permitting reform proposals that come out of Congress in the context of our principles that I just outlined. And we're going to do our best to support the options closest to our ideal approach. Uh, that uh, follow those bullet points in the previous slide. So, you know, anytime anything comes out of Congress, there are always compromises and uh, things like nobody ever gets everything that they want. There's always stuff in there in any package that uh, somebody, you know, that everybody doesn't like. And so it's just a matter of determining if there is more good than bad and then determining if we can support it and then, and then working from there. So how we're going to engage in that process is through lobbying Congress, as I mentioned, also through the media, uh, of course, things like letters to the editor and op-eds and grass chops outreach. Uh, we're not going to do so much uh, grassroots outreach, not going to do tabling and things like that uh, on permitting reform because it's such a complicated project. It doesn't really, it's not very well suited for grass rock, for grass uh, roots outreach. And so we're going to focus more on grass tops and lobby lobbying Congress and through the media. So I will stop there. Uh, here's my information. If you want to contact me, uh, you can also uh, find me oftentimes on the Nerd Corner on CCL Community, cclusa.org slash nerd dash corner. And I will hand it off to Kathy to talk about uh, local stuff and her expertise on the actual deployment of the Inflation Reduction Act benefits. Terrific, Dana. Thank you. Um, 
you gave us such a great kind of overview of what's going on here. So my aim, I'm Kathy Kuntz with Dane County um, Office of Energy and Climate Change here in um, sunny Wisconsin. Um, and my aim is really to take at least some of what Dana talked to us about and give you a sense of, of how at least one local government is thinking about the IRA and implementing the IRA to make things happen locally. And you know, the aim of pairing us was really to give you that overview and then for me to give you a little bit of maybe food for thought about how this might um, deploy for you locally. So to give you some context, let's start with the basics. I'm in Dane County, that's, that's where Madison, Wisconsin is. I think it's really useful always to use the Yale climate maps to orient people to where I am because I am that dark orange rectangle in the kind of light orange to blue Wisconsin when we ask people if, if they think global warming is caused by human activities. So two thirds of the folks here in Dane County say yes to that question, human activities are causing climate change, um, whereas 55% of the rest of Wisconsin does. So that gives you a little bit of a sense. We're a bit more progressive and certainly more concerned about client, climate than, than much of Wisconsin. Um, we're about a county of a little over half a million people. We're the fastest growing county in Wisconsin. Lots of um, meta tech industries here, but we've also still got some dairy industry in the county. We've got a myriad of utilities who serve us locally. Um, we also have significant racial disparities that we are um, trying to come to terms with. But in general, this is a county that, that sort of has the resources to do things. And our county executive, Joe Parisi, when we talk about climate, often says, you know, his constituents expect us to be leading on these issues. So that's sort of who we are. We have for a long time, over a decade, led in our internal operations. We have one of the first, this is a um, renewable not natural gas processing station. At our landfill, we collect the methane, clean it, compress it, turn it into RNG, more than half of our county snow plows run on the RNG we produce. Um, we're also very close to running on 100% renewable electricity locally. So for our county operations. So we've had an internal focus for a long time in terms of, of climate action and climate resilience. This other picture here, um, we're subject to significant um, high precipitation events as climate change happens. We've also a beautiful chain of lakes that we're now trying to expedite water flow through so that those um, flooding events don't become as disastrous as they've been in the past. So, so we've got this tradition in our own operations. In 2016, the county executive created our office saying, you know, that was a moment where, where it was relatively clear we were not going to have leadership immediately at the federal level and we didn't have leadership at the state level in Wisconsin. So, so Exec Parisi said, you know, we need to lead as Dane County, we need to prove what can be done on a countywide basis. So that really was and is the focus of our office. We created a climate action plan to cut countywide emissions in half by 2030. We bring local governments together to talk about strategies. We do a lot of recognition of leadership. And that's kind of the orientation that I come to this from. I think the other thing in terms of orientation, I would say is as illustrated by the projects that the county has done internal to our operations, my boss likes getting things done. And so when we come to this kind of countywide initiative, he really wants us to be partnering with people to dramatically cut emissions as fast as possible, um, which is, yes, it's awesome. It's, it's fabulous. We do that, though, in a purple Wisconsin. You know, there is a reality about, about where we are doing our work. So in Wisconsin, we have a firm GOP majority in the state legislature. That's the, the little map here is our um, gubernatorial election just a month ago where where so a majority of voters statewide elected a, Wisconsin, uh, a Democratic governor 
At the same time, the GOP held um, super, well, they got achieved super majority in one house of the state legislature, and they're very close to it in the other house due to gerrymandering. So we've got some disconnection there. Um, under Wisconsin's constitution, counties do not have home rule authority, which means we can only do the things that the state legislature has said counties can do, which, which certainly restricts um, what, what new initiatives we can come up with. Um, so we can't regulate carbon in any way because we don't have authority to do that. We're also a state that is known nationally for our legislature's um, tendency to preempt local government. So in Wisconsin, only the state sets building codes um, and local governments cannot set codes higher than that. We can't ban plastic bags. We can't organize a regional transit authority. You know, there's, there's a lot of tools that are used in other parts of the country that are, are forbidden to us. We're also a state where the funding for, we have a statewide energy efficiency program what, rather than one run re utility by utility. Um, it was uh, an amazing innovation when it happened in 2001. Its funding has been flat for more than a decade. And so, you know, in general, the um, um, American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy does a state level ranking of states in terms of their, their energy policies. In 2009, we were number nine in the nation. We're currently number 26. So, so achieving ambitious climate goals is tricky in a place like Wisconsin, even in a place like Dane County where we've got a lot of resources because we've got the constraints we've got. And then the Inflation Reduction Act happened. And so, you know, I often with local audiences depict the IRA as a superhero, sort of flying in to change everything for us here in Wisconsin. And, and I'm gonna talk about that in a couple of different ways, how, how the IRA really gives us a myriad of new tools that we can use to really accelerate action. Um, but I wanna start, and this reinforces some things um, Dana said earlier. I, I actually learned, um, this slide comes from a podcast I listened to um, of Tina Smith's um, legislative staff who worked on the Inflation Reduction Act. And you know, often you hear in the national media that, well, why is it called inflation reduction? It doesn't reduce inflation. It actually does three important things to reduce inflation. It reduces our deficit, which is reduces our borrowing and has, infl which has inflationary impacts. It reduces healthcare costs, which are one of the core drivers of consumer spending. And it reduces energy costs. And this is the point Dana was making, that, that there is good evidence that, that fossil fuel prices have driven inflation numerous times in our country. And there is no way we can stop that happening by, by just producing more oil and gas. You know, the, the global market for fossil fuels is much bigger than us. And really the way to mitigate inflation associated with fossil fuels is to stop using fossil fuels. Wind and solar costs are not gonna be subject to the same kinds of inflationary pressures from Russia or Saudi Arabia or anyone else who has this, this global piece of this. So this is an inflation reduction act. And, and just to, I always wanna empower people to be able to talk about that that way. The other thing I think is really important to talk about here is this, this is a, this act is, is just a huge bucket bushel, I guess, of carrots. You know, it's gonna make clean energy cheaper. It's also gonna help us produce more clean energy solutions inside our country. It gives our, our clean energy industry some certainty. There, there are just a benefits for lots of folks. For me in Wisconsin, in Dane County, where I've got these constraints around what I can do, it is hugely significant that, that a tremendous amount of the benefits here are tax credits. Because there's nothing, so the, the, the 
the Congress put in place tax credits that are mostly all in effect until 2032. It would take a new act of Congress to take away those tax credits. Congress is not very good at taking away tax credits. There is really nothing that, that um, our um, local legislature can do to put a constraint on federal tax credits. You know, individuals, businesses can apply for those tax credits and get them. So it's almost like as, as a local um, government leading these efforts, it's like we suddenly got this new layer of, of funding for all of our constituents to do projects that no one can hurt for 10 years. And so that's just a tremendously huge benefit from where I sit. So let me give you a few examples of that. Um, uh, Dana talked about some of this. I am going to just go through a little bit of it again. Um, so on, on the commercial building side, the IRA creates ways for businesses and local governments and nonprofits to benefit from energy efficiency and clean energy. Historically, the federal government was only supporting tax credits that worked for private industry. And so for the first time here, there are a number of mechanisms that enable local governments and nonprofits to participate. And I'll go through just a couple of those. Um, there is under the IRA, a 30% consistent 30% essentially rebate on renewable energy. And it applies to solar, it also applies to geothermal and wind. And entities can get even higher credits if they meet certain requirements in terms of workforce, in terms of where the project is located. So there are all kinds of adders that help us do more around equity, do more around well-paying jobs, you know, lots of that. Significantly on this one, um, the, the instructions in the IRA is that um, Treasury will set up essentially a way even though a local government and nonprofit don't file taxes with the IRS, they'll be able to file a form where they're, they'll essentially say, hey, IRS, I spent a million dollars on a solar array, and the IRS will say, here's your check for $300,000. Good for you. So it creates a direct way for those entities that could not get a tax benefit before to get what is a substantial tax benefit. The significance here for folks is that this one is retroactive to 2022. So if you're, um, I have talked to any number of people in, in, in the county who are having a local government project or a school project going on right now, their faith community is installing solar. Those projects are gonna qualify for this, this rebate. There is a slightly more complicated but equally important um, performance-based tax credit for commercial new construction and retrofit. And this one is based, I love this one, because it's based on the energy use intensity of a building, which is, which is essentially the energy use over the square footage. And if you reduce that energy use intensity by at least 25%, you can get, at 25%, you get $2.50 a square foot in this credit. And this credit, nonprofits and governments can transfer to their builder developer. So it's like a discount on the price of the project. And again, here, there are opportunities for those incentives to go higher if you're using um, crews with prevailing wage and apprenticeship opportunities. This one is really important because, you know, um, we, we have so many existing buildings that are so inefficient. And because this compares the efficiency of that building to what you achieved under the retrofit, it's really an opportunity for us to go after those least efficient buildings and, and incentivize them to, to really come along with the process. So I'm super excited about what we're gonna be able to do there. There is also for businesses, nonprofits, local governments, um, incentives for Fleet vehicles, um, again, these are tax incentives and for EV charging. The, um, there are two categories of fleet incentives. So up to 7,500 for light duty vehicles, but up to 40,000 for 
heavy duty, duty vehicles. Maybe you, you um, live in a community where there's a small transit bus, or maybe your faith community runs a small transit bus that you could electrify under this. Um, there are also opportunities for EV charging here. They are mostly limited to entities who are adding charging in um, low income or non or um, non urban census tract. So, so looking at where we're really missing that charging. Um, the other thing, though, I would say about charging is there's also a tremendous amount of money in the earlier infrastructure bill to address charging. And so as these things couple with each other, that's also going to be an opportunity to um, do more faster here. The on the residential side, it's just awesome on the residential side. So, so there are grants and tax credits for energy efficiency. Um, Dana talked about the grants for home electrification. And on these grants, I should stop here a second and say, so almost all of the direct incentives in the IRA are tax credits. Two exceptions are these grant programs. So both of these grant programs are going to be um, run through states. So the um, energy efficiency um, upgrades, there is, there is $4.5 billion that DOE will allocate to states with some you know, DOE guidelines about what that energy efficiency program should be. That's mostly gonna affect low and moderate income households. In addition, there are increased tax credits for energy efficiency upgrades. So if you don't qualify for the grants, you will qualify for the tax credits. That's part of the beauty of that rewiring America calculator is it lets you figure out kind of where you fit in this. The other thing it's important for me to say here is, is these efficiency and electrification upgrade um, grants and tax credits also apply to landlords. So landlords can get these incentives to electrify units in rental housing. And you know obviously that's an important thing for us to make sure happens. There are also the same 30% renewable energy tax credit applies to residential solar systems. And there are the new electric vehicle incentives for both new and used electric vehicles. And I would note there that there are, um, we're going to see, so there are restrictions on how expensive the vehicle can be. You can't buy a $200,000 Porsche electric vehicle and get this $7,500 tax credit. You know, you, there, there are, we're, the aim here is really to make electric vehicles more affordable for regular folks. And so there's some restrictions around that. There also are restrictions around um, battery components of those electric vehicles. And you might've seen this week when, um, Biden was meeting with Macron. There was some discussion of this. The Europeans are going to push to have those restrictions modified a little bit. I think on all of these programs at this point, it's important to say that, that um, a number of the rules and, and specific requirements are still evolving. We expect that we're going to see the guidelines for the tax credits first, in part because some of those tax credits are retroactive to 2022. So, like, you know, there's only 28, 27 days left in 2022. The um, Treasury has to get those, those rules out on the street pretty quickly here. The grant programs are going to take a little bit longer because DOE is going to have rules and they're going to put them out to the states and then the states are going to have to decide how they exactly apply those rules in their state and then, you know, it so the grants programs, my guess is we're probably looking at um, early next summer before I expect those to be fully up and running. Like Dana, I want to emphasize, and it's cool that you've got a um, direct link to this, this Rewiring America calculator. And partly, I love this because they've integrated tax policy here. So if you put in your information, they'll determine 
if you are above or below 150% of median area income for your area and which, which pieces of this you are likely to apply for. I think it's a really good tool to just play with a little bit and put in some different scenarios um, for imaginary households you know, just to get a sense of how it's going to play out in your area and, and what that can mean as an opportunity. So I want to circle back to this idea. So all of that means there's a bunch of funding there, which is awesome. That, that means this is a game changer if, if we get people to, to take that funding, if, if it's possible for those projects to happen. So this really is my obsession right now is thinking about, well, okay, how do we, how do we make it really easy for everyone in our communities to take advantage of the IRA so that, you know, the, the estimates in the modeling are about what they think uptake of these tax credits will be. Well, I want to blow those models out of the water. So when I think about this, I'm first thinking about my um, local cities, towns, and villages, and school districts, and how I can make sure they're doing projects leveraging IRA, because that's really easy for me to make transparent to everyone in the community, and I can have folks tour places. And so we've got actually a local village who's working on a net zero energy public safety building. And one of my obsessions is that McFarland will get IRA funding now for their facility in a way that lets us lets us sort of cheerlead their leadership, but also put some pressure on other folks to be following that. And then, of course, we also want to be working with our businesses and nonprofits to use the IRA. Um, Dana talked about how important equity is in all of this. You know, we really think that the more we can help our local um, nonprofit senior centers and and BIPOC community organizations green their facilities, that becomes a way to then initiate those conversations in communities about what those benefits are. Again, we've got 10 years, so, so we can do this in a methodical way. So really, you know, the three pieces of this for me that we'll be doing is we have to talk up the opportunities. So I'm talking about the IRA with everyone constantly. Um, we need to we need to be as the county office of energy and climate change the the technical sor assistance source so that if someone says i can't find the form to apply for this i need to have an easy place for those links to be and then we need to showcase those early successes we do a lot of things like our climate champions program where we're used to celebrating local leadership we need to do that here on the individual side, I think it's it's also about leveraging, but it's really a network approach here. So, so we're anticipating that, you know, we're gonna slowly see these rules about different pieces of the IRA. And as we see, as things are finalized, as Treasury says, this is how someone applies for this this tax incentive or, or, or DOE says in Wisconsin say, well, this is how the electrification grants are going to work in Wisconsin. We're essentially going to create bite-sized summaries. You've got a little example bite-sized summary for me there. Bite-sized summaries of each opportunity that we can share out with our partners, which include those local governments and school districts but are also, also our faith-based communities, our climate action advocates, our local CCL chapter we've been talking about these issues with, our equity and BIPOC organizations. I've got a number of large employers who are interested in putting this in their employee newsletters and helping their employees understand that there are ways for them to save money at home. You know, so really trying to maximize all the ways we can um, get the word out about these programs so that as many people as possible benefit from these programs um, across our communities. Because, because again, this is the best shot I have at, at funding for large scale climate action, kind of given the other constraints 
that I've got as a local government and that probably any number of you face in your local states and communities too. So with that, I just, you know, my contact information and I hope we're all ready to um, start leveraging the, this like crazy. Awesome, thanks Kathy. That was super informative and I love to hear about these specific details and I also really like your passion for uh, informing people and getting them to take advantage of these IRA uh, incentives because that's like that's going to be like the key thing that we need to do right now is that the incentives are there but we need to make sure people know about them and can take advantage of them to actually get them deployed. Well and that aren't yeah thanks Dana and aren't intimidated that that these come from the federal government and that sounds really hard. You know, we, they're for a little community or school district to, to hear me say, you're, you can get money from the federal government. They're like, well, we don't have a grants writer. I'm like, no, it's gonna be simpler than that. But, we, but that's, an, you know, there's a, there's a trust thing there to get them to that place, to try that. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Okay, so we have a lot of time for questions, which is good because it looks like we might have a whole lot of questions. So our team, uh, Mindy, Keston, Thad, I think are going to be moderating some questions for us. I've been, I've been doing my best to try and wade through. We have over 400 participants on the line here with you. So thank you very much, Dana and Kathy, for all of this input. Um, and we've got over 100 questions that people have put into the into the Q&A. Um, and I appreciate those that have been upvoting questions to kind of give us some idea of which ones are most important. Um, so I've been doing my best to try and wade through some of these to give you some, some of those questions. And Kathy, I think you've touched on a, a, a theme here from a lot of people of like, wow, this is a lot of information. It's really complicated. We want our municipalities, we want our states to be able to take advantage of it. Like, where do we even get started in, you know, in finding the right information and feeding that to our local municipalities, counties, and states? So, so I can tell you in Wisconsin, you know, we are, every state has a state energy office. They're probably the epicenter of thinking about this. And if you don't know your state energy office, now is a great time to get to know them because because they're going to be. And I think one of the things I'm saying a lot to officials at the state and in, in other um, counties across Wisconsin is, you know, there this is this is unprecedented funding for clean energy. We want to make sure everyone in Wisconsin gets their share. You know, we we we're we've been lagging on some things. This is our big chance. Let's go. And trying to make it a kind of state pride. Of course, we're going to figure this out thing that kind of helps people, but it's, it's a lot. And, you know, there are, there are good, the, the kind of typical national resources like ACEEE and RMI are trying to make this simpler, but if you're a smaller community, it's pretty overwhelming right now how many things there are here. And, and so, you know, at the end of the day, I always go, you've got to just, you know, chunk it out. Let's think about which pieces might be most useful to us and focus on those first. And then we'll focus on other things and, you know, take it step by step a little bit. Thank you for that. I'd like to go back even to some of the basics, uh, Dana, of what you covered. Here, here's the first like really basic question. Why are 2005 emissions the starting point for our targets? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. It's just something that each government, when they set their Paris commitments, they kind of, they get to choose whatever their Paris commitment is. And so they tend to choose like sometime in the past where emissions were relatively high so that it's easy to get a relatively big target. Like if you start when emissions were low, it's hard to you know, you reduce emissions like it's hard to get a big number out of that. And so 2005 is when our emissions were pretty high. And so it's kind of a good starting point if you want the number to sound big, basically. But you got to start somewhere. So that's what uh, that's what we chose as our starting point. Thank you. Um, there's also a question about, can you explain a little more about fossilflation um, and what mechanisms in the IRA prevent it? Yeah, I mean, it's just general. Fossilflation is the contribution of fossil fuels to inflation, which 
they are a very big contribution because so much of our economy, less and less, but still so much of our economy depends on fossil fuels. And so fossil fuel prices are very, very variable. They go up and down and up and down a lot. And when they go up, that then makes the price of a lot of stuff in our economy go up and that causes inflation. And so anything you can do to transition away from our reliance on fossil fuels, like electric cars instead of gas powered cars, heat pumps instead of fossil fuel powered furnaces, things like that, uh, those will rely more on electricity, which electricity prices are very stable because they come from a variety of different sources from solar, wind, nuclear, geothermal, also natural gas, but like it's a variety of things. And so electricity prices do not spike very much. And so then if you're relying more on electricity, you're relying on much more uh, stable prices instead of volatile prices, and that guards against uh, inflation in the future. I noticed uh, uh, someone else had entered in the Q&A, and it's true for us in Minnesota here too, that our electric utility is currently applying for a rate increase um, mm-hmm. through the Public Utilities Commission, um, which seems a little counter uh, to the fact, as we're watching our percentage of renewable energy grow in their portfolio at the same time, they're still, do you think that, you know, what do you think contributes to that? And is that potentially part of the need for transmission lines that might be part of what is driving that as well? It could be the need to build out more infrastructure. It could also be the fact that we still use a lot of natural gas for our electricity and natural gas prices, like oil prices are going up, especially with issues with Russia. Um, So there's probably a variety of factors contributing to that. But even when electricity prices go up, they don't go up by nearly as much as gasoline prices will go up. Thank you. Um, There's a lot of questions that are also happening in our Q&A here around renters. Um, I think one of you touched on a little bit for um, owners of rental property too, of what what the incentives are there. But how do the incentives help renters, especially when we're looking at a lot of lower income people may be more likely to be renters than owners um, of their homes? I can um, jump in. I, you know, I really think part of these these new IRA efficiency and electrification programs are really going to build on low income weatherization and bring more rental housing into the mix, because the the rules for low income weatherization to um, address a rental property are pretty stringent about income requirements of a certain number of the occupants of the building. And, and now to have more additional funding that can go after those other units, I think we're going to see more um, activity here. The, the, one of the other incentives that I didn't mention, um, there is a new um, tax credit for builders and developers for new energy efficient housing that applies to single family and multifamily that that could could be a huge game changer for new affordable housing in terms of the level of those incentives so like we're thinking as a local government about well how do we get our developers to build to that new standard and take advantage of that incentive as soon as it's out there you know but it's it is complicated, Mindy, and it's partly complicated because we don't want we don't want to fund efficiency upgrades to that housing that then increases rents and gentrifies neighborhoods and makes people lose out in another. You know, they're they're we've got to do this in a thoughtful way that involves community, but we also you mentioned you're in Minnesota. I mean, in, in our states, we've, we've got to think about how we make this housing more resilient to high heat events and things that, that it's not resilient to right now because it's starting to be a life and death issue in our communities. Yeah. And related to that, um, what about the challenges of charging an EV if you don't have your own garage or a dedicated parking stall or a home EV charger. <laughs> no, that, that's yeah. a big one, right? <laughs> it, you know, I can tell you some of our communities are starting to put um, in zoning ordinances. So again, we can't, we can't um, do our own codes, but we can, communities can say, if you're building a building with, with eight or more 
units it needs to have conduit for at least two charging stations or you know we can start to do some things to to increase the likelihood of this but i think honestly we're still all trying to figure out how we get charging into those neighborhoods you know we're talking a lot about some of these pilots that have happened in seattle and i feel like somewhere in massachusetts where they've got um charging infrastructure on um, city streetlight poles that can come down on the pole and be a charger. And that seems really useful to us in some of our neighborhoods where people are living in three flats or something where it's not about off street parking, you know? And so there's a lot of pieces of this that we have to figure out. I mean, I think it's ideally some of our local CCL folks are part of the folks who are sitting at tables trying to figure that out with our local government officials. We don't have an answer. We need to figure out an answer that works for communities. Yeah, I mean, that's a really tricky one. Uh, another part of the solution is to get more businesses to install chargers. So, so for, for example, if you're commuting to work, then maybe when you're at work and, and you know, you're, you're in your office for eight hours a day or whatever it is, then you can charge at that point. Um, but yeah, it is a, a difficult challenge to make sure there's charging available for everybody. That's why it's good that also the bipartisan infrastructure bill had a lot of funding for just EV charging in general, because like the more places that we can get EV chargers installed, the more accessibility there will be for everybody. Thank you. There's also a number of questions about, you know, how is the IRA funded and how secure is that funding? I know, Kathy, you talked about that some of it is tax credits that are in place for 10 years. Um, but then, you know, how do we how do we ensure that all of this great stuff that's in the IRA stays there and continues to be available? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, there is a combination of grants and tax credits um, that were paid for through changes to the tax code and uh, changes to taxes for corporations and things like that. Um, so that could hypothetically be changed by a future Congress. But as Kathy mentioned, like, that's pretty unpopular to take away people's tax credits and incentives. So it's it's probably not something that a future Congress will be working too hard on to take those away because that's not a popular thing among the voters. Um, so I think pretty much they should be pretty, the funding should be pretty secure, I would hope, but that's something that we at CCLB will also be working to protect in the future in any lobbying that we have to do if there are any proposals to in some future, uh, you know, bills or budgets to, to, to erode some of that funding, we will be advocating to uh, make sure it's protected as best as we can. Thank you. Um, we heard a lot of talk about wind and solar. There's a few questions about nuclear. Is there anything in the IRA that, that addresses nuclear energy, either, either direction to encourage it or discourage it? Yeah, I mean, there's just a general uh, clean energy tax credit that applies to nuclear. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's pretty pretty similar to the tax credits that uh, wind and solar can apply for and nuclear energy can apply for, too. Um, so it's just a matter of getting the nuclear technology to the point where it is uh, cost effective to take advantage of those tax credits. Then we have a question like, what's the plan for communicating benefits to uh, states, local governments, municipalities. We're hearing that, you know, we can be part of those messengers as CCL volunteers, but is there like a part of the IRA that, that requires that communication to be sent down to states? Or is there a standard mechanism of how states learn about new federal legislation? Um, and there's no like communication requirements, but like a lot of this, as Kathy mentioned, is, you know, it's the responsibility of state energy offices. And so, you know, they're going to have a lot of responsibility in the deployment of these programs, uh, at least the grant programs. And then, you know, a lot of the rest of it is just federal tax credits that people have to be made aware of. Um, so like we at CCL, one thing we're going to be doing is, you know, trying to communicate this through educational outreach. We do have a uh, Inflation Reduction Act slide deck that is available for volunteers, which is pretty similar to what I showed today. Um, so volunteers can take advantage of that, uh, use that slide deck to do local presentations about the benefits of the IRA in general and how their local communities can take advantage of those uh, incentives and 
uh, rebates and tax credits. Uh, so I would definitely encourage our local chapters to do that if they view that as a, a possible thing to do in their communities. Thank you. Because yeah, I think there's there's lots of questions of like, how do we prepare our local communities? How, you know, we can talk in the generalities. And then I'm also hearing some of that, well, we're just gonna have to wait until the rules are finalized. Is that was that correct that that some of the rules about exactly how these will be uh, implemented aren't quite ready yet? Yeah, it is true that 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 for almost all of these features, the including the tax credits, the final rules aren't in place. I I guess my own sense is we there's a lot we can do to get organized while we're waiting for those rules. If we wait until the rules are announced to go, okay, now who should we be talking to in our community? That's you're but you're behind now because other I can tell you in Dane County, we're I'm already getting people excited that they're gonna get emails from me once a week with cool programs they can share out, you know, because because I need their heads in that space before the before the data starts flowing so it it gets received appropriately, you know. So it it parts of this will be slow and it's frustrating and it's complicated, but it's also our best opportunity and we need to just go, okay, this is so much better than what we had six months ago in terms of how I was gonna meet my goals. I'll take the complexity. So it sounds like building relationships is again key to the work that we need to do here uh, and, and getting out in front of building those relationships now so that as we have more information to provide that that's something we can we can be doing. All right, the good news is those are skills that CCL volunteers are good at. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we are. There's a more specific question about um, renewable portfolio uh, standards. And is that something that we could be doing at a local level trying to increase those? Would that be something that might complement um, what's coming for the IRA? Yeah, certainly. So a renewable portfolio standard is basically when a state says we have to get X percentage of our electricity from clean sources by date Y. Um, so yeah, though, I mean, those are always really useful on a state level to get your state to make this rapid transition towards clean electricity. I mean, it's not something that we can do on a federal level for, by, from CCL because that is a state by state thing to do, but certainly individual chapters uh, and individual states can encourage their uh, state governments to take policies like that and, and make them into reality. And then what what particular components might be of use to small municipalities? Like, are there things that municipalities directly can uh, apply for? So there are going to be a lot of, you know, really, I focus today on on the tax credits that are going to be for for that municipalities could use for their own facilities. But but um, Dana talked about the the various um, sort of gr competitive grant programs. There are gonna be a variety of competitive, there are still a variety of competitive grant programs under the infrastructure bill that are still rolling out. I mean, I think it's fair to say between these two pieces of legislation, there are competitive grants that are gonna roll out to communities and local governments over the next probably 24 to 36 months. I mean, there's, there's, there's an awful lot here. I really, though, there always want to think about what, what does Dane County or the city of Madison or some other local government apply for directly? And what do we empower our community-based groups to apply for so that there are some kind of community-led solutions around some of these things, particularly in the environmental justice space? So, you know, there, there, so there's like, different layers of what those opportunities are going to be. And are there any savings that might apply to like a homeowners association as opposed to individual homeowners? I think that's going to be in the specifics of the rules. That's like a tricky, like, maybe, I mean, given the way things apply to landlords, there might be a way that that happens, but but it's gonna 
they're going to have to wait for the specifics of the rules, I think, to understand that. And I'm realizing it may depend on how a homeowners association is organized, since there are some that are applicable to nonprofits. So if it right. is right. formally organized, they might be able to apply in those ways. Yeah. And it's, it's that piece of, I mean, we have these conversations locally about where you've got an, a homeowners association that owns you know, it's maybe townhomes and the HOA owns all the roofs. And so then how do people get solar? It's a, there, there's a complicated piece there that hopefully gets a little clearer in, in, in how Treasury writes some of these rules. Yeah, that's always a challenge when we get a new bill passed. It's, you know, it's written in legalese and then like the federal agencies and, and state agencies have to interpret that legally is to determine exactly how these things are going to be applied and who qualifies for what. And so that's why there's a little bit of a delay in figuring out exactly like once the bill is passed, we still have to figure out exactly how it's implemented. Mm -hmm. So what about rooftop solar? There are comments here, uh, you know, rooftop solar doesn't require the same expanse for transmission lines, um, even though it's not quite as at large of largest scale as potentially solar farms in more rural areas, but what are ways that we could be encouraging more rooftop solar or are there additional, are there different incentives for where the solar is being installed? Yeah, I mean, in the IRA, I believe it's extended existing tax credits for rooftop solar, but I mean, that's always great when we can get a tax credit extension so we can get that confidence it's going to continue on in the future. Um, so yeah, that is always a benefit of these distributed local uh, renewable energy uh, uh, projects that you don't need that long distance transmission because the solar is on the rooftop in the city where the most of the electricity demand is. But I talked about this a little bit yesterday that, you know, there's only so much rooftop space and parking lot space that's available and we just need so, so much more wind and solar energy that you're going to need these big wind and solar farms out in the countryside as well as uh, the rooftop and parking lot solar. So it's a yes and, and it's great that we have these tax credits being extended for both like rooftop and uh, big solar and wind projects because uh, we're going to need as much of it as we can get. But uh, so yeah, there are benefits for both of them in the IRA. Mm -hmm. And I know something we're seeing in Minnesota and Kathy, you may be seeing the same in Wisconsin that because of climate change, they're increasing what the snow load capacity is that our roofs need to be able to withstand. And so some of our older buildings are saying we can't add rooftop solar because we're already not meeting the new codes for snow load because our snow is starting to come in bigger times, you know, bigger downfalls at one time. Yeah. Are you That's, seeing some of the same, Kathy? Well, well, see, our trick is, Mindy, you have much more updated building codes than we do in Wisconsin. So if we, we mostly in Wisconsin say, why can't we have updated building codes like Minnesota? So if we had updated codes, that probably, that's a fascinating, yeah, issue about those, those older facilities and what, what can happen there. But yeah, I would just echo Dana that, that a couple of um, environmental groups in Wisconsin recently did a study looking at sort of what it takes to clean Wisconsin's electric grid. And it's just really clear that, that if, we, if we have the um, upgrades to the transmission, this can happen in a much more cost-effective way than it can happen otherwise. It's just the, the difference in cost is just dramatic that, that we need a lot of clean electricity and we need, we need to be talking about transmission in a more serious way than we have been. Mm -hmm. And are there incentives for small kind of um, electric um, I would say vehicles, but there's been some questions like electric snowblowers, electric lawnmowers, um, especially larger, I think of larger ones that are used by cities for uh, mowing parks and such. Um, are there incentives other than like just regular vehicles? Are there incentives for electrifying other smaller vehicles that might be utilized by municipalities and counties? The the commercial riding lawnmowers are are supposedly going to be included in the commercial incentives for the 30% tax credit. Um, and I've seen a couple of 
publications. And apparently there was discussion of this in the Senate that people definitely wanted. So, so not at the residential level, that electrification, but yeah, parks departments or something using big vehicles. It looks like there will, will be some incentives there for that, which is cool and might, might accelerate that category of products in a way that ultimately makes those, those electric options more affordable for homeowners too. Because part of what, and we, we didn't really talk about this, but you know, by, by creating incentives that, in, that make heat pumps more efficient, we're going to see more heat pumps produced. This is going to greatly accelerate the production of cold climate heat pumps for Minnesota and Wisconsin and other upper Midwest states. That will inevitably drive down the price of those heat pumps. You know, they're, they're, there is this virtuous cycle that we're starting here that is going to be really beneficial to us over the long term that that induction stoves are going to become less expensive because lots more people are going to be buying them and and you know in the same way that that all of those other products when you think about um the trajectory of cellular phones from those first really big shoes that people carried around with them to what we have now and what it can do. I mean, they're, they're, yeah, we're, we're in the beginning of a bunch of these electric technologies being just on a dramatic cost reduction curve in the same way we've seen with solar and the way we're starting to see with batteries. Yeah, and one on this topic, one provision that unfortunately didn't make it that was in the original Build Back Better was incentives for electric bikes which would have been really cool because, you know, it's both like a healthy thing to do and a low carbon thing to do and a very low carbon transportation method. But unfortunately, from the Build Back Better to the IRA, it kind of got cut out just when they were trying to decrease the, the cost of the overall package, even though it's a pretty small little piece. So we were kind of disappointed by that, but no e-bike uh, tax incentives. I don't think it'll slow down the popularity of e-bikes, though, They're at least not popular. from what I've been seeing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good that they're still popular. Yeah. 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 There's uh, been a few questions about um, opposition, you know, maybe specifically from the fossil fuel industry, but are you sensing that there will be much opposition? Is it something we should concern ourselves with? And, you know, are there things we should be doing to combat any opposition to the IRA and, and our yeah, I mean, there... clean energy? There really hasn't been much. Like I mentioned, the fossil fuel industry didn't really lobby to kill the Inflation Reduction Act as it was being negotiated. Um, and I mean, there just there hasn't been very much, which has been really great to see. Um, they're also in the, the last election that just happened, like in the campaigning leading up to election, there was very, very little, very few campaign ads or arguments made by uh, anybody to to uh, basically against the Inflation Reduction Act, like nobody was campaigning against it, really, for the most part. And so I think because in part because of the way it was built, that it is, as Kathy mentioned, it's almost all carrots. It's all like tax credits and rebates for the most part. And so it's very popular with everybody. And so uh, I don't think we have to worry too much about anybody uh, fighting to repeal it or fighting against it based on what we've seen so far. And I mean, that could change, but I think it's pretty unlikely. If it does, like I said, we'll be ready to fight to keep those things in place. Maybe the only place I would worry about opposition building is where you've got gas only utilities who start to be worried about the loss of revenue and customers. So in Wisconsin, almost all of our utilities are ele sell electricity and natural gas, the same utility. And the reality is electricity is more profitable for them. So, so I think they're all in various ways kind of coming to that the world is changing. But I think that is that issue is more complicated in states where you've got electric only utilities and gas only utilities, and there might be dramatic winners and losers in this kind of thing. And, and or unregulated fuel providers who, you know, the heat pumps are most cost effective today in Wisconsin for people who buy propane. And as we start targeting some of those households with these new opportunities, we might hear from the propane industry that, you know, they're 
So we're thinking that, you know, some of that flack is going to come from some of those places. Insofar as this is about individual consumers doing things that make their lives better and more affordable, I think it's hard to, you know, we're, we're, we're not in Dane County talking about banning gas hookups. That's not a, first of all, if I said that, the legislature would pass a law to ban counties from do, doing that within seven minutes or something. You know, they'd break a record to do that. Um, but it's also not what we think is practical. These are, these, are, these are more affordable solutions that give you better air quality that are going to, you know, make, make your home more comfortable. And that's the way we've got to position this. We've got to win on the merits here. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I think local opposition is is where the opposition is going to come from. And we're also seeing, like, in a lot of places, local opposition even to wind and solar projects based on a lot of misinformation about, you know, the effects of, of those wind and solar projects or the aesthetics of them or whatever it might be. So that's more where the opposition is going to come from is from local communities and counties and things like that, as opposed to the federal government, I think. There have been a couple questions here about um, as we electrify everything, you know, how do we know that we'll really get our electricity from clean sources or might we get ahead of ourselves if we're electrifying before we have all the clean energy infrastructure in place? Might it in the short term increase some of our fossil fuel electricity production? Yeah, I mean, that's the chart I showed about the potential amount of coal that we're going to be burning in 2030 in different scenarios. And if we do do a lot of electrification and don't do the faster transmission build out, then that is a concern that we'll end up burning more coal, at least than we would otherwise have. It's, we are still expecting to see a decrease in coal overall, just because the wind and the solar and natural gas are still cheaper and still will be replaced at some rate. It's just that it might not be replaced fast enough if we don't get the transmission built quicker. And so, yeah, I mean, it's still important to electrify everything because eventually we'll get that clean energy transmission and infrastructure built out. Just a question of how quickly it happens. Uh, so ideally we'd be doing both things really fast at once, uh, but we want to do both things really fast either way. And the thing I would add to that is that, that for something like a home heating system, that only gets replaced every 15 to 20 years. So it might be that that there's a two year transition period here where where your emissions go up slightly, but then they go down for 13 more years, you know, or 17 more years. And so we've got to be we've got to be pushing on both things at once, but but we've also got the life cycle of the appliances we're talking about are relatively long. And so missing an opportunity to electrify means we've got we're burning fossil fuels inside your house for another 15 years. And, you know, I really think, I'd like to think we're, we're fast approaching the moment where, where we're just going to largely agree that it doesn't make sense to burn fossil fuels inside our homes. I mean, so I grew up in North Dakota. My grandparents had a coal burning stove in their basement that sometimes they used when, you know, in certain weather conditions. That feels crazy to me. And I am convinced that my grandchildren will think it's crazy that's, that we burn natural gas inside the space where we live to cook food or to heat our homes. They're just gonna go, that was just nuts that they put that in, you know, we're, we're at that, we need to make that transition. And is there a place here at the same time for like carbon sequestration? Was that a uh, part of the IRA as well that for any of those kinds of things that might reduce the emissions of our fossil fuel burning right now? Yeah, there's a tax credit for carbon capture and sequestration at uh, power plants or other sources of carbon emissions. Um, so, I mean, that still requires the uh, facility to for it to be a cost effective for them, even with the tax credit, they still have to be cost effective to capture that carbon as opposed to, for example, just replacing the coal or natural gas facility with a clean energy facility. Um, so, you know, carbon capture is challenging because there is the concern that if you implement this carbon capture technology, it extends the lifetime of the fossil fuel power plant and then the other air pollution associated with burning the fossil fuels there. 
Um, on the other hand, there are going to be applications, especially in the industrial sector, potentially things like making uh, cement and, and steel where we're probably going to need carbon capture uh, because those are very hard to decarbonize sectors. And so it's good that we're working on that technology for some applications that we can't replace very easily with clean, cleaner uh, options. Um, so it's very complicated. Uh, there is an increased tax credit for carbon capture. I don't think very much of it will be used for power plants because wind and solar and batteries are becoming so cheap at this point. And like even with tax credit, you still have to install this expensive technology on an already expensive fossil fuel burning power plant. Um, so... Yeah, but we're still going to need it for some applications. So it's it's an important thing to continue trying to make cost effective, at least for industrial applications. Thank you. There's another back to basics question. Can you explain tax credits and how people who don't pay or taxes or may pay low taxes get benefits? I think you explained a bit about how nonprofits or organizations that don't pay taxes can get a rebate, does that apply also to individuals? And then how do tax credits work in general? So the, yeah, so so essentially the way some of those residential programs are gonna work, um, if you are at or below 150% of median area income, you're gonna be eligible for grants instead of tax credits for projects, which will be just direct buy downs equipment and some of that might well come through the vendor so it might be a discount on the purchase price of a heat pump or an upgrade to your electrical panel or an induction stove um the the tax credits more of them are so so the old version of the tax credits you needed to have a tax burden bigger than the tax credit to get the tax credit and that's increasingly not true with these new pieces that you can get the tax credit even though you don't. But low and moderate income households, a chunk of them don't apply, don't file taxes, which is why the grants are really important for those households that that aren't that don't have income sufficient to be required to file taxes to begin with. So I think with the IRA, it's like the first time we're trying to braid together options so there's something that works for everyone you know and it's it's again we're going to have to see all the rules of all of those pieces there might well be some gaps that that two years from now ccl is talking about hey there are households that look like this that aren't getting the help they need because there's a gap in this funding but but that you know we're incrementally, this is moving us in the right direction. And hopefully, ho hopefully we don't see those gaps, but it's a lot to figure out for the feds. Yeah, I mean, just to, at a really basic level, it's kind of when you do your annual tax returns in the spring, March or April, whenever it is, um, as you're filling that out, you say, oh, this year I installed an electric heat pump water heater. And so then that'll apply that tax credit to your annual taxes and you'll get that credit on there so that you have lower tax payment. And are any of these incentives um, available if you've already done these things in years past? Are they retroactive? Not typically. No, you're you you get the grow you get the satisfaction that you were about those early adopters that have moved these products into being viable for everyone else. Yay, you! <laughs> Yeah, I installed an electric heat pump water heater this year, and I was like, mm, if I had waited a year, I could have gotten some tax credits, but what are you going to do? Well, we have just, uh, we have like two minutes to the top of the hour, so I have just one last question, which are like, what are the one or two most important messages that our CCL volunteers could either be writing letters to the editor on or talking to their members of Congress uh, about the Inflation Reduction Act? Uh, I mean, I'd say, I mean, the most important thing to communicate to people in general is like the existence of that Rewiring America uh, calculator uh, to tell people that that exists and they should check it out and take advantage of these tax credits and rebates that are available for them to upgrade, electrify, and uh, weatherize their homes. I agree. I think it's that there are these opportunities and that maybe um, letting particularly local governments know that 
that there are credits from the IRS that are going to be available to local governments, even though local governments don't file taxes. You know, that's a new thing for that to be available. Um, yeah. So giving, giving, getting people interested in poking at, oh, I should learn more about this is just a really good thing at this moment. Well, thank you very much. There, the, the interest is obvious from the number of questions we weren't able to get to today, but the, Kathy and Dana, I just want to thank you so much on behalf of all of us uh, for such a great session today with so much detailed information. Yeah, thanks, was, Mandy. Thanks, Kathy. You did an awesome job. Well, it was it was fun to do this with you, Dana. Yeah, and, and thanks to everyone for all the questions. It's great to see all that interest and momentum out there everywhere. Yeah, totally. Thanks, everybody, for coming to our session today and learning more about the IRA. That's right. Go forth and earn some tax credits. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.